This time on Norfolk Perspectives, we got some really exciting things that are going to put Norfolk on the map, and guess what? It's called Opera Initiative. The uh, Norfolk Historical Society has monthly programs that you're, you know, you're going to want to participate in because it's a great way to really have an appreciation of where we are and where we can go. Red Cross needs your help in a variety of ways that uh, only you can roll up your sleeves and do something about. Stay tuned for some great stuff right here on Norfolk Perspectives. Welcome to Norfolk Perspectives. I'm Bob Batcher. And did you ever think that you could use the word exciting and future and opera all in the same sentence? Well, I got two people on the sofa that are going to do that. Wes Mason, how you doing? Very well. How are you, Bob? Welcome to the sofa on Norfolk Perspectives. It's great. It's great to be on the sofa. It's, it's great to be in Norfolk. Yeah, it's, it's a cool time. Well, we're going to talk about that. And Suzanne Orbendorfer, how you doing? I'm doing well. Welcome Thank you. Welcome to the sofa. Okay, I got to say from the get-go that I've known you guys a long time. That's true. But we won't go out. there. We're not going to go there. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no secret stories, no personal stories. But okay, you got me to talk about opera. Come on, that's why we do it. Oh, that's the whole point. Is it still an art form that's completely pertinent to today? It's um, singing the same things, the same stories that you hear on the radio. It's just we do it in a different language and in some kind of fun costumes. Yeah, yeah, yeah some funky so. costumes, and then. I never thought, you know, the, the, the precursor to uh, subtitles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You got to read about it. Mm -hmm. But you got this word that you threw in here called initiatives. Well, I think the biggest thing, you know, the arts community is changing the, mm -hmm. with the economy and everything like that. And I think the biggest thing at this point is you kind of have to make your own path. Um, you have to, to work any way you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so <laughs> for those of us that are here, we saw so much talent in the area. And there wasn't really a venue for early professional classical singers, um, but a lot of talent without a venue. Mm -hmm. So we got together and decided it was actually just going to be kind of a sing-along for friends that developed into something way beyond what we had originally intended. And uh, putting stuff on our resumes, performing, and hopefully bringing on as many as pe pe people as we can. So. Well, let's talk about, okay, what did you first imagine? Uh, You're sitting around a, on the sofa talking, right? It was. It was a, a phone call to my father, actually, on a discouraging day, and I'm oh, like, Dad, I've I just don't knows. know what to do. I know. <laughs> Dad, guys are good for that, I've you know. It, and I, I got to say, that's oh. how I know you guys. So we have a common, yes. common you, a friend of yours Wonderful. and a daughter of mine. Yes. 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 And um, and he's like, well, you should start your own your own opera group. And I'm, I don't want to do that. I just want. <laughs> and called him back the next day and was like, well, maybe we can just put something together this summer. And called one of my dearest friends, uh, Catherine Kelly, who's a soprano that I work with a lot. And I um, was like, well, what if we just did a, a role study? We'll work together and coach it and make sure we have something on our resume. And that phone call turned into dream casting the rest of the opera. <laughs> and then we pulled in one of our other friends who happened to have a tie into the Governor's School for the Arts. And the whole thing exploded in a wonderful way. And all of a sudden we were, it wasn't just six singers that were gonna put on a show, but we had Governor School coming in as our chorus and the ability to actually do something that would not just benefit us, but benefit the entire area. Well, I was gonna say, we're getting ready to set up for the show mm -hmm. and the, the third segment's gonna be with the Red Cross and mm -hmm. all of a sudden Rob Shapiro just bolts me over, <laughs> runs over in the set and, and gives you a giant hug and a kiss. For what? Well, one of the really important things for this group is that um, we give back to the community. We're asking you to invest in our lives, in our careers, and in our education from high school on up. And uh, we really believe that we need to return the favor. And so last month we did a recital um, to benefit the Red Cross specifically for the victims out in Oklahoma. And um, this was the brainchild of Catherine. She just, she decided that this was a wonderful direction mm -hmm. to take and all of us said, yes, let's go for it. So we put on a recital um, that featured about 20 singers from the local area and um, charged a minimal ticket price, but all the proceeds went to Red Cross and we actually wound up raising over $1,200 for the Red Cross. Now, now, Wes, I got to tell you, and I, I, I'm going to say this because <laughs> I got to talk about your mom. Can I talk about your mom, please? <laughs> I mean, you know, we all know about the 10-foot mermaid. Your mom is there <laughs> refurbishing them all. That She changes their personalities, the whole nine yards. So she and I have been working together for years. Yes. But we can't get a conversation with going with, uh, I think she puts a timer on. Okay, you've talked about Amanda so long. Now I get to talk about <laughs> Wes so long. 
<laughs> so I've heard about your school pro. Now she's never told me about uh, exams you failed or anything like that. Oh. She doesn't know about any of those. But I, I hear about Wes all the time. See you on Facebook all the time, and now you're coming home. Yeah, it's it's great to be home. Uh, I, I've been waiting for what would be the right opportunity to come back to do a performance. I've wanted to come home and, and do a hometown recital for a while, and I've just been swamped uh, with you know lots of intensive study. I've been at the Academy of Vocal Arts for the last four years, which is a, a wonderful program out of Philadelphia. That's a free tuition program, and it's uh, essentially. You know, if you're like a Shakespearean actor, you would go to a really great Shakespeare school and study there and get full in repertoire. I had to do that at AVA, except it was full on operatic repertoire for four years. So once I graduated from there and I was hopping on Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, I see this Kickstarter for the opera initiative. And I say, oh my gosh, that's Suzanne. It's my friend. <laughs> he went to Old Dominion for two years before I transferred out. And I saw that they were putting on this production of Cozy and that they were raising this money, and it was all about cultivating local talent, mm -hmm. casting local talent, and I was like, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Donated it, and then we started chatting on Facebook, and I threw an idea out about uh, coming to do a recital and to raise money for funds, and uh, that's kind of how we, uh, we hooked up and yeah. got the idea of coming back home. See, what's really kind of cool is uh, quite often a constant guest that's on the sofa is Hugh Copeland and mm -hmm. Hurrah Players, yeah. and then you got the you got the Governor's School for the Arts, which we're going through this huge initiative mm -hmm. yeah. in uh, combining them. You're in town to do a master class with them. Yes. But, like, what happens then? Isn't that really the kind of it, the issue? You go off to New York, go off to Philadelphia, Chicago, or whatever. But what about here? Well, and that's exactly it. There really isn't, for the classical singer, yeah. there hasn't been much solo venue in this area. Mm -hmm. um, there's the wonderful Virginia Opera, but you need a pretty substantial resume to, <laughs> right. to be on main stage. And yet stage there's a lot of that. chorus. There's we a are. lot of chorus. I mean, Absolutely. And, and honestly, most of us sing in the chorus. They are in a covered role. See, because somebody's out like there saying, she looks familiar. <laughs> I, I, see I was an Indian woman. In, you know, uh, yeah, very rarely do I look anything like myself on stage. I don't think it's, you know, it's, another, <clears> it's another chance of doing it. We always look like someone else. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a fantastic I know this thing. is tough for you yeah. guys. You yeah. yourselves today. No, right? I should it's, have put a different character. So if somebody oh. really kind of gets plugged into this and wants to do something, who, who do they, well, Facebook we have, or what? Well, we have, we have Facebook, and you can find under Tidewater Opera Initiative. You can contact us there. We also have our website, tidewateroperainitiative.org, and we have, you can contact us through our email there. Um, uh, we have ticket sales on there and our upcoming event for our, t our show um, on August 16th and 17th, Cozy. Um, and where's that going to be? It's going to be at the Perry Family yes. Theater. Yay, at mm -hmm. the Hurrah Building. Um, they've actually very generously cut us a deal for a, a new cool up and coming. Theater. It is. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's intimate. Theater. Um, and it's just perfect for us starting out because I think that's one of my, um, my goals in starting this was to make sure that we didn't do a production that was bigger than what we could do well. <laughs> um, and we're really excited to have this cool. chance and to partner with so well, I tell you what, I, I, I just gave you guys seven minutes of the roughest job you've ever had to, because <laughs> getting two singers to talk is hard. <laughs> so I want to have you guys back on. Okay. I'd love to. You know, before your August show to, to come on and maybe do some singing instead. Oh, we would that? like that. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Singing, yeah. And Wes, we're glad you came back. It's great to be here. Keep your mom busy, please. I will, and she'll, okay. she'll keep us busy. But don't distract her. <laughs> she's got a mermaid due in September. Uh, she's oh. got several. Okay, that's right. <laughs> Thanks a lot you know, for everything that you guys are doing. Oh, thank oh, you thank for you. having us on. Thank you. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the Historical Society, and yes, they really are cool people, too. Stay tuned. <laughs> The odds of this daughter of a clergyman spending 11 weeks at number one on the U.S. singles charts? One in 19 million. The odds of going on to win six Grammy Awards? One in 1.4 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 88. I'm Tony Braxton, and I encourage you to learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Welcome back to Norfolk Perspectives. And you know what? Historians are cool people. They, and Peggy Hale McPhillips, how you doing? I'm doing great, Bob. Thank you. And did, have you been called cool lately? I just I think you are. was. You just called there me cool. There we go. Because cool. you, and we're going to talk a lot about the kind of stuff you're doing on a monthly basis, but it's not a matter of just sitting back and reading books and meeting. You're bringing back people who we never thought we'd see ever again. We bring back dead people. I know it. 
We've had George Washington, we've had Patrick Henry, we've had Benjamin Franklin, Mark Twain, Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, you had, yeah, and you've seen them all on 48. On 48. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you yeah. for yes. Channel 48 for taping and rebroadcasting even on YouTube. I know. Well, they're, they're cool programs. Now, okay, but what I don't understand, you can bring all these people back. Uh -huh. You got an IT guy sitting next to you. I mean, I that's just, where I know oh, you from. Just, I love history. It's, it's marvelous. We live in a, in a town that's been here since the, the mid-1600s, and our history goes way back, and a lot of uh, history touches right here. Battle of Craney Island, uh, a very important event in uh, the War of 1812. We just uh, celebrated the bicentennial of that on, on June 22nd. We have Fort Norfolk, which is one of the premier forts, uh, of the 17 forts, originally commissioned by George Washington. It's right downtown, mm -hmm. probably one of the crown jewels of Norfolk. So, I mean, there's just so much history in this area, every bit of it. And, and I can't, you know, I, I, and I'm constantly teasing because you have Peggy on to talk about the, 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 the magazine coming or the, uh, the, the calendar and a lot of the things that we do through the Sargent Memorial Collection and the, the opportunity to celebrate our stories. But I am, I'm going to pick on you, Chip, because sure. you, you keep us safe in the, in the computer world. You're constantly looking toward the future and anticipating. And there are people that would say, this history stuff is irrelevant. You know, we ought oh, to just no. be moving on. Oh, no, our I mean, history is important. You've heard that before, though, I'm right? I'm sure, but our history is important. It's who we are today is where we came from, and all of us come from somewhere. And right now I'm from Norfolk, which is, you know, has this wonderful history and past. And he uses his IT skills to help promote our history as our social media guide for yes. the Historical Society. I do social media. Well, wait a minute. Are you telling me not only are historians cool, we're They're the, plugged into social media? We are in the 21st century. We have almost 400 followers on uh, our Twitter account, at Norfolk History. Um, you can see, uh, in fact, we, t today is an important day in Norfolk History. Uh, in 1957, the bookmobile was first deployed here in Norfolk uh, uh, into the Tanner's Creek Annex. And uh, amazingly enough, this very week, uh, we just, we just uh, deployed e-books in the library. So 50-some years later, we've moved from... Uh, bookmobiles to e-books, but you wouldn't know way. that unless you follow history. Very cool. That is cool. Now, and, and Peggy, mm -hmm. Chip brings up something, kid, and you know, my pet peeve. When we first got email with the city, one of my favorite emails that went around all the time was your "A Moment in History." I loved doing that. You well, bring that back. I could bring, bring it, back. it back on social. Mm -hmm. But sure. explain to the viewer what that was. It was really cool. Every Monday, this is. Our city manager's idea, Jim Oliver, mm -hmm. said maybe once a month you could come out with a little snippet about something that happened in Norfolk. And I said, I can do that every week. Oh, so every Monday, a lot of weeks in the every year, Monday you know. I deployed a little bit about the first telephone service in Norfolk, the first automobiles, different bits and pieces about Norfolk history. And now we can do it with illustrations and things that we couldn't do back in 1998. Mm -hmm. Well, and the pilot still has, in fact, you contribute to that. We do. We sure do. About do. Uh, what's in a name and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I think exactly. it's, I know that now that we've got the iPhones, we can't get through a night of watching TV without Googling something. Right. Right. Okay, Chip, one of the, I have a challenge for you. Sure. Because one of the things I always pride Peggy in is I've never been able to stump her. Oh, you'll stump me. Is there any, well, no, we'll <laughs> see. Is there anything in the history of Norfolk you've always wanted to know but never had the right person to ask? Now's the time. Gosh, anything I wanted to know. Careful. No, I... I okay, well, I, let's talk about Fort Norfolk. Okay. Okay, the purpose of Fort Norfolk? 1840? Originally, yeah. Fort Norfolk was uh, built on the site of one of 19 earthenware forts that were commissioned by George Washington in 1794 as coastal fortifications. It was reinforced when it looked like we might go to war with England again. It turned out to be the War of 1812. Many of the buildings there today date from 1810, and it is the only one of the 19 fortifications commissioned by Washington that is still in existence. And some of that stuff was talked about at the MacArthur Memorial Visitor Center Theater in your monthly presentation, exactly. which we just got done showing. Exactly. We had Colonel Olson, who is currently the yeah. Colonel um, District Commander of the Army Corps of Engineers at Fort Norfolk, Norfolk District. He talked about that. We had somebody this past month talk about the Norfolk Fire Rescue Museum. We have, we have a variety of programs. The second Wednesday of every month, we have something that you're going to enjoy. Yeah. We have refreshments afterwards, so you can visit. And our audience is growing. We're it is. almost 100 people this past time. Now, so it is growing. Now, let's talk about the, uh, 
the, the role that the viewer could play as their life goes on and there might be a generation they've just lost or an individual. I mean, they can also participate in telling their stories, right? Oh, sure, sure. We're talking about doing a oral history program, a session. The MacArthur Memorial Visitor Center Theater is a perfect place to do that. We could have people come down and do their memories, uh, memories that they had shared with them by their parents and grandparents. And we find the pattern when people start talking about it, we find that all of history really builds on on other history. Well, I remember, so we were, I remember a do. meeting we were at uh, with some people about voices, and, and um, they started talking about this doctor with a horse. Yeah. And it turned out that they all knew the same guy in his final years. I mean, uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's one of the beauties of really celebrating and being prepared for the future. And right? it's all about stories. And one thing that we do that I really want to emphasize, um, every year we participate in the Access Scholarship Foundation. Access that was founded by Josh Darden and Frank Batten. Uh, the Norfolk Historical Society contributes $1,000, which is matched by the foundation. So we give a $2,000 scholarship to a young person in one of the Norfolk schools who plans to go into one of the fields of history. So we feel like we're giving back to the community in our so own way. So if a viewer way. feels like they're not the expert on history, but they want to know more, where can they go? They can come to the MacArthur Memorial Visitor Center Theater at 7 o'clock on the second Wednesday of every single month, and there will be something there for them to learn and people for them to meet. And you know what? That's cool. They'll have a good time, I promise. And follow us at Norfolk History. Uh, I, I saw that we have our website up there. It's currently under construction. We're, we're taking a look at that. We're also on Facebook, and we're revamping our presence there. So right now, our strongest presence is on Twitter at, at Norfolk History. Uh, and you can always just tweet us and ask us some question that way also. You know, I never thought I'd have a close a segment by saying just tweet us. Yeah, from a finch. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for everything you guys doing to bring your story on that note. We're going to get ready for the Red Cross. Stay tuned. <laughs>
Okay. In full disclosure, I, I obviously had been with, involved with Red Cross for a long, long time as a professional and career person. And I, I've got to honestly say, and it really has been still striking me home, up until a couple of years ago, um, it was always for someone else. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter, who at the age of about 25, 26, fell into an unknown blood disorder that we still don't know what it was about. Mm -hmm. And over a 35-day period, probably used uh, donations from thousands of people who were doing plasma because she was right. having complete plasma transfusions. Wow. Talk about hitting home. Uh -huh. But that's really what we're talking about is in the... It can happen just like that. Oh, definitely. If there's it's a need, right? 97% of us will either need blood or know someone who needs blood. And you know, when you think about that, that's almost all of us. And we often tell people that um, blood needs to be on the shelf, ready to go when that trauma, when that emergency hits. You know, a lot of times we think if someone we love needed blood or platelets, we would, you know, go out and donate. But that blood, that product needs to be on the shelf, ready to go when that person needs yeah, it. Yeah, because, Rob, we were talking, I mean, when you're talking about the response to the fires now, yeah. there's, there's a call put out. We need donations to support the fire. Okay, I'll write a check or I'll tweet, I'll, I'll tweet it or I'll <laughs> yeah, text the, uh -huh. the ten dollars to write. You know, <laughs> right. Dancing with the Stars right. was consumed by that. You could do it after the fact. Uh -huh. Blood no. donations don't work that way, do they? No, and, and not not only that, but they have a shelf life. Blood has a shelf life of 42 days. Platelets have a shelf life of five days. So we constantly need to replenish that supply. Okay, explain the difference between blood and platelets. Uh -huh. then. Um, well, your blood it. It's used for like their transfusion. So if somebody has um, common uses are premature infants are born with about a cup of blood, and they often need a lot of testing. Wow! Did you say that so again? Did you say a cup? About of a blood? cup. Premature infants are born with about a cup of blood, and they require a lot of testing often, not always, but often, and that blood needs to be replenished. Um, people with sickle cell anemia often need blood transfusions. People with um, leukemia and cancer often need some type of blood product, um, routine surgeries. Platelets are the clotting factor in your blood. It only has a shelf life of five days. And the primary use for platelets in our community is for people who are, are um, battling cancer and leukemia. Mm -hmm. And boy, just sit back, think about the people that are have, you know, that you know that have cancer. Mm -hmm. it, it touches so many people. And, um, and a lot of our platelet donors come in because they know someone who needed platelets. And then they become, I met someone this week, 94 donations. His nephew um, has required platelets, well, and he's just, it's easy. Now, there's a variety of ways. I mean, you, you're mm -hmm. still harvesting platelets off of a general blood donation, mm -hmm. too. But that's, those are pooled platelets, so they come in from a variety. But there are people who can't take those. Uh, who can't take the platelets? Pool, pool if plate, if I mean. you can, a whole blood donation can be uh, segmented into platelets, plasma, and um, and also red blood cells. Right. So um, I'm not too but sure. But trying to get people to go move into platelet uh, uh, phoresis. Uh huh. I'm, I'm, I can't I'm remember impressed. this stuff. I'm impressed. You're right. The the amount when when the segment uh, when when the blood components are separated is so much smaller. It takes many more. But when mm -hmm. you come in to just donate the platelets, um, it's it's a, a bigger. Um, product for that recipient. So it's just, I can't say enough about our platelet donors. And it's the first time that I've been able to come out and say, hey, we're on urgent need because we are having a tough Explain time. Explain that. I mean, I mean, summer months are always yeah. tough. And, and I'm sure there's somebody out there saying, oh, we always hear, uh -huh. you know, what is the old thing? Uh -huh. People are on vacation, donors go on vacation, patients <laughs> uh -huh, don't, uh -huh. right? So what makes this different? Well, normally you do hear me saying, hey, we need to replenish the blood supply because it, it does have a shelf life. Right. But June was an extremely tough month, and we, across the board, across the country, we were down 10% in blood donations, which wow. equated to 50,000 donations. It's, it's huge. The average blood transfusion is about three products, um, or three pints of blood. So we also had 4th of July week. We had that Thursday, 4th of July. You know, most That's people right. were taking the Friday off, so a lot of businesses were like, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to be able to run a blood drive because so many of our employers are you know, our employees are, are kind of doubling up the taking the long weekend. I get that. And then I did that. <laughs> um, uh, approximately 20% of our donor base is made up of high school and college students. So when they take the summer off and they go on summer break, we feel that dip. And some of them leave outside of our area, go home, and then come back to college here. So it's just all those factors coupled in. And then this urgent need for platelets, again, that shelf life is five days. And wow. Um, platelet process takes a little bit longer, but it is, it's just something, you just feel amazing when you do it. Well, in, we've been real proud. Our residents have really stepped up in the neighbors building neighborhoods, the idea of really Great. helping your neighbor. What better way? So check out your website and find out how you can become involved. Thanks a yes, lot. Yes, thank you, you so much. In fact, we want to hear from you what you'd like to see 
go on in your neighborhood or what's going on in your neighborhood, give us a holler at 664-6510. And as usual, it's a wonderful time to be in Norfolk just because of you and you and you. Thanks a lot.